This video is brought to you in collaboration with wowhead.com. Hello everyone. At BlizzCon, they announced some of the plans that they have with the storyline with the upcoming patches. And while 8.1 is only a month away and mostly available on the PTR by now, 8.2 is still quite a mystery. So I thought it would be a fun idea to sit down and talk about some of the things that they've announced for Rise of Azura. Some of the backgrounds, maybe even speculate on what's to come. With that in mind though, do be careful, I am going to be talking about BlizzCon stuff, so spoilers ahead. Magnificent. One of the major points of patch 8.2 that could be found within the name is the Rise of Azura. The Queen of the Naga is finally going to face us, and I say finally, since her story that goes way back over 10,000 years ago to the days of the War of the Ancients. She and the Highborn had made contact with Sargeras and the Legion, and had come up with the brilliant idea of summoning them to the world. The Queen was a beauty to behold, and not without power. The Pit Lord Manoroth, when he finally made his way to the planet, he thought that her might would be a force against which only his Lord Sargeras and Archimond would prove to be superior. The trolls were forced to bow down to the Queen and her people's magical abilities, and Illidan, he could see that she had an aura around herself, which enthralled even the demons to love her. Bringing Sargeras in had her envision a world of perfection. One cleansed by the flame, she and Sargeras, a power couple to rule this world. With the use of the Well of Eternity, they worked very hard to create a massive portal, a massive gateway. But of course, not everybody was down with that plan and a resistance was formed. People like Melfurion, Tyrion and Illidan, but also the Dragon Aspects and the Demigods as well. They formed an army to fight back and were eventually able to reverse the portal and send the Legion back to where they came from. The use of all these magics, it made the well incredibly unstable and this sundering took place, which split the land of Kalendor apart with a big ass maelstrom in the middle. Now Azara and those still with her, they were caught by the waters, but she refused to give up. She was the queen, the light of light, she had not given permission for any of this to happen. Yet the waters would not be held back forever, not even by her incredible magical powers and the darkness it took her. In the dark, voices came to her. The old god Nazoth offered her a deal. He had watched her, known what she was all about. But Azura, she was not going to hand herself over into slavery, not even with death so close at her doorstep. Instead, she was going to be a queen in allegiance with Nazoth to return to the days where he ruled the world, the magnificent Black Empire. So it was that she and her people were transformed into the Naga, and for many years we have seen the Naga play their part. We had Lady Vash with Illidan, Vajir and the capturing of Neptulon, who is of course the elemental lord of water. Even Azara herself made an appearance in the revamped Darkshore and the Legion, we saw them going after the Tidestone. On some of the Naga, they stepped away from the Queen and joined the Burning Legion instead. It has taken them quite a while to get here, and the Naga's goal, it seems to have been to reclaim the land from the surface dwellers, but also deal with their addiction. Like the Blood Elves and the Highborn, the Highborn, they were very dependent on their Well of Power, the Well of Eternity, and with it gone, they also felt the addiction set in. This was mentioned as far back as Warcraft 3, with a conversation between Vash and Kilfas. But more recently, we've seen Naga mention it again, as they're trying to drain the magics from Krakwa. It's curious though that they still have the magical addiction. You'd imagine that allying yourself with an old god that might come with some perks. Perhaps even some remnants of the Well of Eternity at the bottom of the sea. But here we have it, they still have that addiction. So that is what Azara and the people want. They want to the bask in the glory of Nazoth's empire, Azara's empire, as she would be a queen. After the raid on Zandalar's capital, both sides are pretty hurting. They've lost a whole lot of troops, a whole lot of champions, and of course their ships. While licking their wounds and trying to figure out what the next move is going to be, the Naga, they're going to make use of this opportunity, this moment of weakness, and they go on the assault. Across the shores of Zandalad and Calteris, they'll make major the attacks, dragging people with them under the deadly waters. Something dark and evil is going on beneath the seas. Hint at with the Murloc quest that you get from the Ionid expeditions. So despite not being at full power, we're going to take those few remaining ships that we have, those few remaining champions, and we're going to set sail to the great blue beyond. What we find is rather unexpected. There's a crack in the ocean, a chasm of sorts, surrounded by waterfalls. We find a whole new land to explore, a very, very old new land. We are going to go to Nashatar. For Nashatar. The Azara's old empire, named Zinajari, the glory of Azara and Darnassian, named that way because they loved their queen so very much, that was in ruins. She, together with Lady Vash, they oversaw the creation of a new one, far from the light of the sun. We're going to start our adventures in the south, an area called the Ship Graveyards, meaning that our entrance into Nashatar, it's not going to be that smooth. 
You might remember how we began our partying into Fashir. I imagine something like that is going to happen, only now with the beautifully updated Kraken models. From the graveyard, we're gonna make our way through the beautiful kelp and coral forests, and even get to see the ruins of Zinajari, the ruins of that ancient elven empire, but we'll also see a bit more of the Naga architecture as well. There are the Naga dwellings and the Naga military ward. Within the middle, there's the eternal palace, the seat of power for the queen. Now along this journey, it, it won't just be a stroll in the park, we'll meet new allies and new foes. Foes in the form of eyeball jellyfish, right? There's plenty of old god influence to go around, or some of the more elite troops amongst the Naga, as well as their adorable children. Allies in the form of, well, there's the Horde, who will meet a group of former Naga slaves. They're holding up in a cave, they're just barely able to survive. Amongst them are Gilblins, goblins with gills that were accidentally created by Hobbert Grabblehammer. These aren't just Gilblins though, in an interview they mentioned that they'd like to see these new allies accompany us through the zone, accompany us through the adventures in Nashatar, and that this Gilblin isn't just any ordinary Gilblin. He is going to have a story that we'll have to discover during our time in the zone. Now next to the Gilblin, there are also the Makrura and the Sea Giants. While the Alliance, they're gonna make friends with a deep sea tribe called the Aunt Cohen. From their art, we can see that there's some variation of the Jinyu. And the Jinyu that we've known so far, the ones introduced with Mr. Pandaria. They were murlocs that found a way to the magical waters of the Vale of Eternal Blossoms. Under its influence, they evolved into a larger and more intelligent race with the ability to communicate with the water. Now this variation has apparently been fighting with the Naga for quite a while, as over generations they've been all but wiped out by their enemy. With so few of them remaining, they'll never be able to raise their tribe in population again. Those of them that still remain, they dedicate their lives to slaying the Naga, and we're going to help them get the revenge. Revenge as we fight away to the palace, a raid with 8 bosses, they've even hinted at a potential underwater boss, and of course Queen Ajara is also going to play her part. No confirmation yet on what her fate is going to be, perhaps we will slay her, perhaps she's going to make an escape. I personally hope that Ajara is not just going to be a Gul'dan, but who really knows. At least she is going to get a patch named after her, and considering the mounts that they teased and the layout with the waterfalls on the sides, and being able to see the Naga Empire with her very own eyes. I'm very very excited for all of this, considering that we are going to go to the sunken city. Is this going to mean that we'll finally be able to open up the puzzle box of Yaxaron? I really wonder. For Nomragon! Next to Nashitar, we'll also get a more gnomish adventure. Yep, a gnome adventure, it's the end of days, I swear. In Tidegard, we already met up with Perrin Tinklocket, we had a good friend of Borellis with a tinker shop, but one day he just stopped all correspondence with his state of foreign affairs. He wasn't exactly able to look for him until quite recently, and it's just not him either. It seems that all of the gnomes that were living in the city, they just up and vanished. His search begins in these ruins, the abandoned junk heap, where we help him by surveying the area and gathering plates from the sentry bots that are a little bit hostile. The information is definitely interesting, but at first glance, it doesn't tell him where his fellow gnome went. He'll look over the information that we've gathered and contact us again if he finds something interesting, and apparently that's going to be in patch 8.2. When we log in, the vault door is going to be open. Inside, there's a transponder, a radio signal, technology the likes of which no one has ever seen. Gnomes and goblins, they jump at the chance to figure out what it's pointing at. What they find is a new landmass for us to explore, a little bit smaller than Nashatar is going to be, but we're going to go to Mechagon. This is an ancient lost city of the gnomes. We'll begin our adventure out here on the Junker Waste, beset by deaf robots. We'll quickly find out that this is not a happy place. But we're going to meet allies as well. Allies and Horde are going to make friends with a group that's being haunted by these robots, and we're going to learn a lot about them, learn more about the Junker gnomes. These little guys and girls, they're a little bit more broken down, a little bit less mechanical, and a bit more fleshy than the regular mecha gnomes that we've seen. The way it works in their society is that the more robot parts you have, the higher up you go, right? Obviously these Junker gnomes, they're not down with their way of life, they're not down with the King Mechagon and his visions of turning everybody into robotic components. They are going to be our allies as we venture forth into a gorgeous society inside yet another vault. By the way, through many different kinds of robotic enemies that are allied to the king, until we've made our way to a brand new, mythic only, big ass mecha dungeon, a boss is inside, with the final one being their king, inside his lightning shrouded palace, piloting a giant death robot. That's what we know from BlizzCon so far, and Mechagon, as well as the citizens, that is new to the lore, but the mecha gnomes are not. 
There have been reports of gnomes in the area, as far back as the days of the Drust. On one of their stones, it shows multiple conflicts, or perhaps one great battle with many different scenes. In the oldest, they fight beings that look like themselves, or great beasts. In others, they fight much smaller beings that assemble gnomes in stature. In another, the Drust are driving some naga back into the sea. Where the carving is most recent, the Drust are fighting men and women bearing anchor sigils, the history of fighting against the Kaltiran settlers. So from this stone, we learn that the Drust has been fighting against gnomish kind of creatures before, and the gnome origins, as well as the Drust origins, as they have been confirmed to come from Vrykul. That all lies with the Titan Keepers, specifically in the case of the Mecha Gnomes, with Titan Keeper Mimiron. Created and empowered by the Titans, Mimiron and the others, they worked on fighting against the Black Empire, imprisoning the old gods, and giving the Titan Spirit of Azeroth a chance at life. Now to help her spirit mature, two machines were placed upon a planet. There was the Forge of Wills in the northern part, and the Forge of Origination within the southern area. These machines would help with infusing Azeroth's spirit with cosmic energies, shape its early thoughts and perception, control the rhythm of the deep earth, and fortify the world soul's form. With the twin forges and in Azeroth, the keepers then moved to reshape the surface of the world. To this end, they called on the new generation of servants, wrought from the Forge of Wills. Each of these loyal and mighty titan forged, they would all play a different role in ordering and protecting the world. These were creatures like the Mechanomes, but also the Mogu, Irvin, Tolvir, Vrykul, Stone and Sea Giants. Each of them had their own role to fulfill. In the case of the Clockwork Mechanomes, designed by Keeper Mimiron, they would help build and maintain the Keeper's extraordinary machineries. Yet the old gods would not just sit idly by and be imprisoned. They worked very hard on breaking free, especially the old god Yaxxaron, whose dark manipulations eventually had Keeper Locum betray his kin. The curse of flesh was spread through their machinery, a curse designed to make these creations of the Keepers more vulnerable to the old god's corruption, as well as literally giving them flesh. That's how, for example, the Irvin turned into the dwarves, the Vrykul into humans, and the Mechanomes eventually into the gnomes. Now Mimiron had begun investigating, wondering what was going on, so Loken, he took care of him before he figured it out, but he did not end his life. His loyal and faithful mechanomes, they discovered that their master spirit lived on. They scrambled to build a giant mechanized body to house the Keeper's fading soul. This heroic act, it did indeed save Mimiron, but he was never the same again. His brush with death, it had broken his mind. He secluded himself in Uruar's vast workshops. From that point on, he spent his days lost in the inner workings of his clockwork inventions. Time will pass on, with Yaxxaron eventually taking over the facility of Uruar. And the Keepers, they were actually there meant to guard him. Mechanomes and others of their creations, they would venture forth into the world beyond, eventually falling to the curse of flesh. Now the idea of turning gnomes into robots, as we see the king of Mechagon wanted to do, or turning them back into their original forms, it's not exactly a new one. Those that are quested within the Bodhi and Tundra, you might remember facing off against Gear Master Megazod, who also wanted to bring the gnomes back to a time of perfection, the time of the Titans. He was ready to offer them immortality by removing the curse of flesh. While in actuality, he was turning them into robotic slaves. A threat that we took care of back then, and I'm really curious how this civilization inside of Mechagon has evolved. What kind of inventions and mechanical bosses have they come up with? Will this be Gnomedagon on hyperdrive? Will they actually implement that war described in the Blinktron notes? Those Blinktron bots that engineers can make, you've probably seen them and accepted a couple of gift packages from them. They've definitely seen a couple of upgrades over the years, and the 5000 units, they can also give you a decoded message in its package. Just known as the war, it's a conflict described being between the Blinktron units and an unknown threat led by something called IRT-0. The war is fought out in the caves of the magnetic chasm below the molten Eternium Sea. Eternium, that was a metal that we found on Outland, so perhaps this war is more of an otherworldly kind of place, or perhaps it's actually locked behind this vault, we might find ourselves face to face with IRT-0. Who knows, I would love it if they actually remember the detail, but just seeing more gnome lore added to the game, and the goblins are having their part to play as well, that's pretty damn amazing. I think the last time that we got any major gnome lore developments, I think it was near the end of Wrath of the Lich King, with trying to retake Gnomeregon, and I also believe that this will be a beautiful moment to add that gnome and goblin couple that we read about in Before the Storm. I truly can't wait. Apparently, there's also the vault of Keeper Mimiron that holds treasures of technology and titans. The goblins, they could take these plans and of course make much better things, much more lucrative things than the gnomes ever could. I can't wait to explore this area and go through the mega dungeon. If it's the quality of Karazhan, should be pretty great. Plans? Little old me? What sort of plans could I 
possibly have. Then, as a final note, there is of course the ongoing conflict between the Alliance and the Hordes. So far, we've seen Saurfang and Sylvanas make the plans of securing peace for the Hordes by destroying their enemy, destroying the Alliance, with the campaign at the Dark Shore, and the plans of taking Teldrassil. For this plan, Malfurion was a prime target to take out, but Sylvanas, she decided to let Saurfang take the kill, who felt that it was wrong to do so as it went against his honor. Honor, honor, honor. The War Chief wasn't too happy about this, but she blamed herself as much as Saurfang. Perhaps it was even Alun herself who had intervened, stayed Saurfang's killing blow, and she wouldn't be the only force beyond the Alliance to oppose Sylvanas' true objective. That true objective, that secondary plan of hers, they've hinted at it, but it's still being kept a mystery. But in that moment, Sylvanas then decided to burn down Teldrassil to make up for Malfurion still being alive. Saurfang couldn't believe the choice he had made, and he was ready to find his warrior death in combat just before the siege of Lord Aron. Sakan, also known as Zeppy Boy, he convinced him to stay. The Horde is all they have, and all they have is each other. The old soldier, he wasn't ready to give up on the Horde quite yet, but the actions of the War Chief during the siege, actions like using the plague and resurrecting her own troops, that was not the honorful way of the Horde, not the way that he signed up for. Left behind in the courtyard, he faced the Alliance troops, led by Enderwin Rin, the King of Stormwind, whose life had been spared previously by Saurfang when they faced each other in combat. Instead of execution, instead of the death that he so desperately desired, Enduin, he decided to imprison him instead. They would speak of honor and how it may have be reclaimed, but a final confrontation with Sylvanas, they didn't exactly end the victory. Lord Rowan was blown up, kicking the war of Battle of Azeroth into overdrive. Each side goes out to gather Azerite, despite Magni Bronzebeard warning them not to do so, and instead focus on healing the world. Both sides go out to find new allies, the Zandalari and the Cal Tyrants, with a war campaign attached to it, each side venturing into enemy territory. The Alliance is eventually able to secure a way to the capital of Zandalar so that the fleet doesn't get decimated again, while the Hordes, they end up with the Abyssal Scepter, one of the most cherished Tide Sage artifacts. In the correct hands, it will grant the user great power over the sea. They also resurrected a whole bunch of people to use in the war campaign, and they uncovered the body of Jaina's brother, Derek Proudmoore. He fell, finding the original Horde during their first invasion of Azeroth, and now his corpse is in the hands of Sylvanas. In patch 8.1, the war campaign will continue, as well as the siege of Zulazar, a raid called Battle of the Zaralor. With both sides, they will go through a different raid experience depending on their faction, with the option to eventually play through what the other side does as well. Enduin realizes that the Alliance alone cannot win this war against the Banshee Queen. Saurfang sees what Sylvanas does to his horde, and he wants it back. He wants it back the way that it was before they threw their honor away. He was on board with her plans of securing peace for his people, but the methods that they're using, they're dishonorable. Not what he believes that the horde is about. So with Enduin leaving the door open of his prison, the old soldier breaks free and begins his journey, be it of redemption or betrayal, depending on who you ask. Similar to the days of Warchief Garrosh Hellscream, we now find quite a divide amongst the player base on who is actually right. Is honor truly meaningless to the dead, or are there some things that are worth dying for? A divide also shown in the quest lines, as you get the option to either side with Saurfang or the Banshee Queen, perhaps even stay neutral through all of this with some consequences attached. Not only in the form of different rewards, as one path currently gives you a toy, while the other just has right, the NPCs are also going to remember what choices you have made. I personally really really like that there's at least somewhat of a choice in the game. I do wonder how much of an effect it's going to have, but that's just something we'll find out with time. I do remember that a lot of people, they were really wishing for choice back in Mr. Pandaria. And speaking of that expansion, a lot of people are seeing the similarities with the story back then and the story now. The similarities, they don't just end with Saurfang potentially taking up the role of Vol'jin back then and coming back to lead the rebellion. We also see Sylvanas holding on to the powers related to the old gods. On the slide, she has Zalatov, Blade of the Black Empire. Yes, I foresee us doing great things together. Zalatov has his dark genesis in an age long before the Horde and the Alliance. An age when the legendary old gods and the Black Empire engulfed the world in shadow. There are many theories concerning the Blade's creation. The more outlandish claim that it's all that remains of a forgotten old god who was consumed by its kin in the early days of the Black Empire. Other theories state that Zalatov is the claw of Yashiraj, ripped from the old god's monster's form and bestowed upon his servants for use in ritual sacrifices. As unbelievable as these stories are, 
Perhaps there is truth to them. Zalatov pulses with the foul essence of the old gods. It is even said that the blade can grant its owner visions of the Black Empire, but all who have looked upon such horrors have lost themselves to madness. Would be pretty funny to see Garrosh have the heart of Yashirash and now Sylvanas have its claw, but at the same time, it could also be that forgotten old god who was consumed by its kin. The number of old gods on the planet that has definitely changed over the years. It's been three and then five and now four with Chronicles and then an artificially created old god with Cahoon. But all these source numbers that are around the time of the Black Empire, around the time that the Titans discovered the planets. It could very well be that before that moment there were more old gods on the planet, amongst them Zalatov, but that's pure speculation. So this artifact, a party with the Shadow Priest during the Expansion Legion, talking about how magnificent the Black Empire was, how a war with the Legion was not a true war and how the prison was weakening and Azov was drawing close. With Sargeras eventually stabbing the world, Zalatov, like the other artifacts, was used to drain it, but eventually made it dormant. In patch 8.2, according to Data My Dialogue, we'll uncover that Zalatov has changed hands once again and now ended in the possession of someone called Tanatoa. This blade is more than a dagger. It is a torch that shall light a path forward. Five torches to light our path. At the precipice of oblivion, the area where the small darkest dungeon questline plays out, the area near the shrine of the storms and potentially the crucible storms raid where we're going to see a bit of Nazoth's body, that is the place where we're going to use the relics to finally turn the tide with Nazoth and his minions. At least that's what they tell us at first, but it seems like they're more interested in the return of the black empire and Zalatov awakens, giving Nazoth a gift to break her final seal and releasing her. Could this mean that the entity known as Zalatov is potentially an old god set from the blade? Possibly, but considering that we are talking about data mine dialogue here, it is still far off in the future. Anything's possible, right? For all we know, Zalatov is eventually absorbed back into the weapon, making it just a powerful artifact for Sylvanas to use. Alternatively, say that Zalatov is indeed released from a prison, then the blade itself could be a container of sorts, a prison to hold something else. When Illyria met up with Sylvanas in the comics, the Void was quite eager to have her killed. The whispers assaulted her sister's mind. Perhaps the blade is going to be a way for Sylvanas to contain the threat, or even turn it on the soft itself. Who knows really, but I do think that the worst case scenario, that would be Zalatov taking control of the Banshee Queen. Hate or really love what she's doing, hate or really love what Garrosh has done, those actions were clearly described as being his own. He was the one who was used in the heart of Yashiraj as a weapon, not the other way around. And I feel that Sylvanas, she deserves at least the same treatment. She is set to make his actions look like an amateur, which is definitely saying a lot considering what Hellscream has accomplished. And it is interesting how very similar things are when it comes to the Mr. Pandaria storyline, despite them saying that her story is not going to be the same as Garrosh. Yet, that can also very easily be done by just giving it a different ending. Garrosh eventually had the Siege of Orgrimmar and was placed on trial. If that doesn't happen to Sylvanas, then technically speaking, her story is not the same. We see many hints suggesting dealings with the afterlife. The spirit of Vol'jin, there's Bonsamdi having a boss. We're gonna go around to ask exactly why Sylvanas was made Warchief with beings from the other side. There's a lot going on in that direction, and I've spent a whole lot of time on Discord just discussing what potential endings there could be for the expansion. They could have Azeroth itself wake up. They could have Nazoth breaking out, rebirth in the Black Empire and set free the other old gods. They could have Illyria fall to the void or another siege to kick Sylvanas out of the mantle of Warchief. There could be infighting amongst the Alliance and win losing control. Honestly, despite how similar the story has been compared to Mr. Pandaria, the future, it can still go in many different directions. Now, there was also an interview the other day that had quite a lot of people confused and a little bit upset. Eurogamer published this, and this interview is with Alex Afrishiabi, who said, Sylvan's ultimate fate is you're going to have to wait and see, naturally. But it sounds like, at least for now, Sylvanas is simply too beloved to kill off. She's an interesting character, and she's a character beloved not just by our player base, but our developer base as well, Afrasiabi said. Like I said, I've been personally working on her since 2006, making stories for her. I definitely have a connection with her in a lot of different ways, and her just ending up as a boss, that feels like a bit of a letdown to me. Sylvanas' destiny is to be found out and discussed by the player base, but are we dismissive to think that she'd just go down as another raid boss because she's a little bit more than that? Does that mean that you will not fight her? He added. Not necessarily true either. The reality is, you can fight her every day of the week in Gromar's Hold, in a raid right now. But I do think that there's a lot more to Sylvanas' story that hasn't been told quite yet. I've heard these discussions on the internet about she's going off the rails. But is she? 
I've been riding Sylvanas personally since 2006, and this is pretty much the Wrathgate and the Blight and the Forsaken, this is pretty much in character. Those were all under Sylvanas' orders. What we're seeing now is an escalation of the plans that Sylvanas has, clearly, and we're in the middle of that. Now that last bit about the Wrathgate being in order of Sylvanas had a few wonder if the lore is being retconned, but I don't think that's the case when you look at the context in which they're talking about it. They're talking about Sylvanas going off the rails, right? Some believing that what she's doing right now is out of character, which is not. She's always been willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. And when he's talking about the Wrathgate, I think that's more in the direction of the development of the plague, which was indeed in order of Sylvanas. A plague that would kill both the living and the dead. A plague that she lied about in the Chronicles. While well, the deployment that betrayed the Wrathgate, that was definitely not the way that she wanted it to go down. I think that's what he meant by that. That she was behind the creation of the plague, but that the Wrathgate itself, that was not exactly according to plan. So yeah, uh, for Battle for Azeroth in the story department, there's definitely a a lot of cool stuff to look forward to and I spent way too much time trying to figure out where they want to go with the story. Is it truly just another identity of the Horde kind of deal like we see with Garrosh or is there more at play? Will we see some twists and turns in the future? I honestly can't stand not knowing and I can't wait to find out. By all means, let me know in the comments down below what you think the future might hold. Where would you like the story to go? But yeah, for now, I think I've been rambling on for quite long enough, and hopefully you now have a better understanding, a better idea of what the future is going to bring. If you're looking for more details, like the date of my dialogue, and all the things that we talked about today, then check out the Delayed Wild article in the description down below. As always, thank you very much for watching everyone, subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!